This is part two of the lecture on imaging of the temporal mandibular joint. Now let's run through a bunch of much less common lesions that affect the temporal mandibular joint. This is just a list of the diseases I'm about to run through. A bifid condyle is really a normal variant of development in which you have both sides of the condylar head develop separately and don't fuse normally. So instead of a nice, smooth, rounded central contour to the condyle, you have sort of a divot in the center. Most of these patients are asymptomatic, uh, although this can predispose to premature degenerative disease. You can get fractures of the condylar head that heal with malunion and look a lot like this, but usually if you see this configuration that I describe as a heart-shaped configuration in the coronal plane, this heart sign, usually you're dealing with a bifid condyle and not a, a healed previous fracture. Bony ankylosis occurs in severe degenerative disease. Uh, you really need to assess this on coronal or sagittal planes because it's very hard to appreciate in the axial plane. But you can see here there is a bony bridge between the glenoid fossa and the condylar head, actually on both sides. That is bony ankylosis of the joint. You can get fibrous union, uh, fibrous ankylosis of the joint as well, and that can often be seen on T2 and T1 weighted images on the MRI. Septic arthritis. Septic arthritis of the temporal mandibular joint is usually from direct spread from deep neck infections. Sometimes malignant otitis externa, also called necrotizing otitis externa, spreads from the external auditory canal down to the temporal mandibular joint and can cause a septic arthritis. Sometimes you get seeding of the joint in patients with sepsis, although that's reasonably unusual. Usually septic arthritis is a non-surgical disease and the joint can heal with medical therapy. Uh, surgery in this case often does not go well. Here's what septic arthritis looks like on an MRI. You can see that there's inflammatory disease entirely surrounding the condylar head with abnormal enhancement on this T1 weighted image. You can see that there's thinning of the glenoid fossa and some bone rarefaction. It should look like that this triangle of bone here and that thickness of bone much thinned. And you can even make out that there is some dural reaction to this uh, infection because it's so close to the middle cranial fossa. So uh, erosion of bone and abnormal surrounding enhancement within the synovial space, those are the findings of septic arthritis. When we see it on CT, we see a proliferation of the synovial space. This is the joint space being expanded. And it is frequently accompanied by erosions of the condylar head. This should be a nice round condylar head here, and it's eroded all the way down to the condylar neck. That is, of course, a late stage of septic arthritis on CT. Here's another example on MRI where you can see the extent of an inflammation surrounding the entire joint, uh, extending into the surrounding soft tissues, as well as what's left of the synovial space, also abnormally enhancing, and not much condylar head left from erosions. Rheumatoid arthritis frequently affects the temporal mandibular joints, 10 to 20% of patients. Uh, patients with juvenile uh, rheumatoid arthritis and juvenile idiopathic arthritis have even more common involvement of the temporal mandibular joints. This tends to be an erosive arthropathy rather than a productive arthropathy like we've been talking about in degenerative disease, and that's our most important distinguishing characteristic. Here's what rheumatoid arthritis looks like in the TMJ. Notice that there are erosions and irregularity, not just along the condylar head, but corresponding to that along the undersurface, the glenoid, as we've talked about before, that's a sign of late stage disease. Of course, in this situation, the patient's history is going to be your biggest clue. 
Here's the appearance of rheumatoid arthritis on MRI. The effusions are uh, the most evident finding on MRI. Sometimes you can make out the erosions, although they're easier to see on the CT. In calcium pyrophosphate deposition disease, also known as pseudogout, there is deposition of calcified material throughout the synovial cavity of the joint. This really helps you see how far out the synovium goes around this condylar neck here with extensive ill-defined fluffy calcifications characteristic of pseudogout as it appears in other joints. Osteochondromatosis, which people are starting to call just synovial chondromatosis, although I like the historical term better, is when innumerable small cartilaginous nodules fill a joint space. It's more common in the shoulders than it is in the temporomandibular joints, uh, but it's reasonably common in the TMJ. It presents with swelling, pain in the joint, and headache, and it is treated with surgical removal. Here's what it looks like on a T2-weighted MRI. You can see in addition to the large effusion and expansion of the synovial space, there are T2 dark dots scattered all through the synovial fluid. Those are the loose bodies. Here it is on CT and you can see individual bodies. This is unlike the pseudogout because instead of a broad area of ill-defined calcium deposition, these are discrete nodules of calcium scattered through the joint. That's what osteochondromatosis looks like. Cheerleader's disease is a famous disease of the temporomandibular joint. It's also called idiopathic condylar resorption. The demographics of teenaged girls during puberty, most of whom have prior trauma to the jaw, is what lends this disease its name, cheerleader's disease. Uh, this is treated surgically, uh, and these patients tend to do well with surgery. Here's what it looks like on MRI. You can see that the normal cortical margin that should come up and around the top of the condyle is lost. That is erosion of the top of the condyle, and there is increased joint space here between the condyle and the glenoid fossa, so that increased joint space characteristic of cheerleader's disease. If you look on a T2-weighted image, you can see extensive edema within the condylar neck and what's left of the condylar head, and you can see that it has been cut off and flattened along that condylar head. We've got one more topic to cover. That is the appearance of the temporomandibular joint after surgery. There are a variety of surgeries that are commonly performed on the temporomandibular joints, including discectomy, where the disc is simply removed, a Teflon implant, which is designed to replace the disc, reconstruction of the condylar head using a piece of the fibula, and then the arthroplasty, which can either be partial, just replacing the condylar head, or total, where both the glenoid fossa and the condylar head are replaced. When you replace the joint, a polyethylene disc is placed between the metallic components to act as a cushion, and it's anchored usually to the, uh, the, con the glenoid component. Um, sometimes patients will have temporary spacers placed before they have completion of the surgery and the polyethylene discs placed. The only one I'm going to show you examples of is the total arthroplasty. Here's what a total arthroplasty will look like. You can see both a component in the glenoid fossa and, of course, the component replacing the condylar head and neck. If you look carefully, you can just make out the low-density polyethylene disc that acts as a spacer there. Here's what it looks like in an axial plane, this time soft tissue windows to emphasize the discs themselves. You can see they are square or rectangular when cut in this cross section, and they are of very low density, normally very low density material. That concludes our review of imaging of the temporomandibular joint.